Welcome to the Spirit of Yorkshire Distillery at The Whiskey Show. Throughout the week, we'll have sessions, live chats and videos showing on our booth. For your chance to win a set of all our whiskies to date, follow the link to sign up to our newsletter. The winner of this free prize draw will be announced on Friday 9th of October at 7.30pm. We'll always be live at 2pm, 4pm and 7pm with special sessions throughout the week. Key dates for your diary are Friday the 2nd at 6.30pm, live tasting session with David and Joe. Saturday the 3rd at 4pm, we'll be in conversation with the Swedish Whiskey Girl. Saturday the 3rd at 7pm, live tasting session with David and Joe. Sunday the 4th at 4pm, we'll be talking all things malt with Munton CEO Tim and his team. Sunday 4th at 7pm, live tasting session with David and Joe. Friday the 9th of October at 5pm, discussing barrel-aged beer with Alex from Wald Top Brewery. And finally, Friday 9th of October at 7pm, rounding up and picking the winner of our free prize draw. And you can always ask us questions using the chat function. These films were part of our Field to Bottle Facebook Live series that we ran every Wednesday for 12 weeks over lockdown. They covered every aspect of our production, from field to bottle, each lasting around 30 minutes. My grandfather bought the farm at the end of the Second World War um, and farmed it until the late 50s. My dad took over from him, farmed it till the mid 80s and I really have taken it over from that point. It's a traditional Yorkshire arable farm high on the Yorkshire Wolds and in the late 1990s, early 2000s we were not making very much money from doing our traditional growing of oilseed rape, wheat and barley. So we had, like everybody else in the country, to start to look to move the business in a different direction. Um, I looked at the resources that we had on the farm at that particular point and the two main ones that struck me were the fact that we had our own water supply and the other thing is that we, we grow a lot of malting barley. So I put the two and two together and came up with the idea of brewing uh, and did some research into that and decided that that would be a way forward uh, for us on our particular farm. So in 2003 we set up the Wall Top Brewery and that's continued to grow over the last 15, 16 years. In 2011 and 12, it seemed like a logical progression that we could make a, a whiskey because the first part of the brewing process and the first part of the whiskey making process are identical. Having explored that, it then needed putting into practice uh, and if I'd not gone and done that, then I'd have gone to my grave regretting it. Tom and I have been friends for many years. Uh, we've played rugby together, uh, we've seen our families grow up together. So Tom uh, approached me uh, with an idea of making Yorkshire's first single malt whisky. I thought it was a fantastic idea and couldn't wait to uh, get involved with him. So we looked into the production of whisky around the country and uh, it was evidence that it had never been made in Yorkshire before, which is very unusual as we have some of the best malting barley growing and in the area and uh, it just made absolute sense to use the resources local to us to produce something completely unique. The next step for us really was to develop a brand behind uh, the story and as we are based only 10 minutes down the road from the biggest Gannett colony in the UK, we felt we wanted to use the Gannett as our mascot as it represents a lot that we're doing at the business. It's very tenacious, it's very graceful and it's full of spirit so we felt that represented us very well. The Yorkshire Wolds is a great area for growing malting barley. Um, it's got thin calcareous soils uh, which barley likes. It doesn't, it, barley does not like big heavy land. Uh, we also have a fantastic water supply as well which comes from the chalk aquifers under the farm. The farm doesn't actually have mains water 
And the one thing about this water is that it's very, very consistent, which is one of the reasons why we think our beer has been so consistent over the last 18 years. So the first part of making a whisky is actually making uh, something that resembles beer, which is called wash. Uh, we do that by using the barley from the farm and sending it down to uh, Munton's malting factory at Bridlington. That comes back to us as a malted barley and we then uh, steep that barley in hot water and make a very sticky sugary solution. From that we add the yeast and we start to produce alcohol. Once we've got this sugary solution and uh, it's turned into alcohol, we end up with an 8% alcohol wash. This is the product we put into the copper stills and uh, this is the stuff that we start to make the whiskey from. Well, we're incredibly proud that we are a fully fledged field to bottle distillery. We've got absolutely everything that we need here on the Yorkshire Wolds for making an excellent whiskey. One of the things that's really important to us is knowing exactly that it's our barley that goes into our bottle. What that also does is it gives us a degree of consistency that a lot of small brewers and distillers wouldn't have because our malt is effectively one big batch. There's only a handful of distilleries around the world that could claim to be fully field to bottle producers. That gives us great traceability. Uh, you can rewind that liquid back into a field, which I find very fascinating and a great story. The sustainability of the farm is really important to us and that's what underpins everything that we do. Um, it was the reason why we started brewing in the first place was to make sure that the farm could continue uh, and could be um, a legacy for the future. One of the things we're trialling this year is direct drilling, uh, which means basically you don't disturb the soil when you plant the next crop. The current thinking, uh, and it's been shown by various different research bodies, that by ploughing the land we are releasing a lot of carbon into the atmosphere which doesn't really need to be released. Our responsibilities as a land user are to make sure that we don't take too much out of the soil or the land and leave not enough for the future. So it's trying to really safeguard um, future years um, with the best current thinking. You don't get many chances to produce something that's completely unique and whisky in Yorkshire is one of them. Uh, you only get the chance to release first Yorkshire whisky once and we felt Tom and I together wanted that opportunity to do something completely different. So we chose the name Filey Bay for our first uh, single malt whisky as we can see Filey Bay from our distillery. Uh, it made absolute sense to use the area uh, as we love the coast, we love the sea, uh, it's ever changing and Filey Bay represents everything we are at this distillery. The next step for us really was to develop a brand and what we didn't want to do was just copy somebody else's idea of what whisky should be. So we developed a brand which stood out, which was different, which was fresh. Uh, again, using all the assets of the area and everything that we felt was good about the area. And we hope we've put that into the bottle, we've put that into the label. And everybody involved in the business has put everything into what we've produced. So we feel that we've, we've produced a brand that is um, completely different and unique. First and foremost, we set up the spirit of Yorkshire to make the best possible whisky we could. But then, of course, we needed to share that. So to do that, we set up the visitor centre and the coffee shop. That is very important to us, that it's not just about the production, but it's also about the people. So thank you for coming to the Spirit of Yorkshire and sharing our journey. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your tour and take away a part of Yorkshire which is completely unique. Hi Jenny, you alright? Yeah, not so bad, thank you. Not so bad. How's your day down at the distillery been? It's been fine, yeah. We've been uh, cleaning the wash still, um, looking at a few uh, of the casks, seeing what we're going to be doing later on in the year, release-wise. Nice, so, that's exciting. Yeah, that's good. And um, how was the cask delivery earlier this week? Oh, on the hottest day of the year. Oh, I know, that was that last week, yeah. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. Good, good weight loss technique. Yeah, do a few more of them. Yeah, just drop some cast. Yeah, it's basically boot camp, isn't it? 
Uh, when, yeah, when you see the people running up and down the cliffs carrying car tires and things like that, that's basically moving casks in the distillery. Yeah, constantly. Yeah. <laughs> 210. <Great>. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 210. I didn't realize it was that many. Nice. Yeah, it's 210 on a container. Cool. Right. Well, we've got a few people. Uh, just I can see some eyeballs coming on. Um, so we'll just give it a couple more seconds until we get cracking. No worries. Um, that's good. That's good. Good. good backdrop today. Nice setup. Looks good. It's not a bad office. No, it isn't, is it? It's very shiny. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Keep it looking nice. Right. Okay. Well, let's get cracking. I think we've got we've got a few people on now. So, uh, hello everybody. Welcome to uh, Fields of Bottle Number Nine. So we're into our ninth week of uh, Facebook Lives every every Wednesday at six pm. Um, a couple of us from the distillery come on to our Facebook for half an hour to talk about a different aspect of our field to bottle process. Uh, so last week we had our distillation part one, in which uh, Tom, who's a co-founder, and me ch chatted about the setup of the distillery and how we got to the still setup and, and how we got to the idea of how we wanted to distill and the kind of uh, spirit we wanted to make. So today, because distillation is such a massive topic, it felt like we'd be rushing and wasting it to try and fit it into 30 minutes. Today, I'm joined by Dom, who's our distiller. Oh, give away, there you go. And, uh, and we'll be talking through the more sort of slightly technical aspects of distilling and the actual distilling itself and how we do things differently and, and what makes it so special for us. So, um, as ever, if you have any questions or comments, just bob them into the comments box just below here, and uh, and I'll pick them up and just be keeping an eye on them. So if you see my eyes darting around, it's not because I'm checking my emails; it's just because I'm keeping an eye on those comments and making sure we're picking everything up. Uh, if they're relevant to that conversation, then um, then we'll introduce them as we go. If um, if actually it makes more sense to leave them till the end, then we'll leave them to the end, but we'll still ask them. Uh, if we don't get to your question, then we'll try and get to you via. Um, uh, via email or private message or something like that too. So uh, yeah, so we're joined by so Dom, Dom Brining, he's our distiller. And then I am Jenny Ashwood. I head up marketing here at the Spirit of Yorkshire Distillery. So uh, there's a nice little thing just to remind us what we're talking about. So without further ado, uh, hi Dom. Okay. You know? what, were you, what were you up to? So I guess to start with kind of distiller, like being a whiskey distiller sounds like a dream job that kind of thing where people must ask you like all the time, how did you get into it? Why this sounds like the most dreamy job in the world, but actually sort of talk to us a bit about your job, I think to start with. So what's the what's the day to day in, a, in the life of a distiller, a Yorkshire distiller? Yeah, yeah so um, as well as distilling, um, so we distill four days a week at the moment. Um, and then yeah, on the off days, we're gonna be cleaning. Uh, we're gonna be racking casks, uh, anything production wise, um, down to bottling, um, sorting out the next releases, uh, bringing down the water to cut back the spirit that you've done the week before. Um, so it's always a busy week. And uh, yeah, it gets busier and busier at the moment. <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? Every every week we have, a, we have a Monday team meeting and every week there seems to be more things on it and more things talking about it. And everyone's like, oh, right, yeah, let's get cracking then. Uh, we must get moving. So I think, and like I say, we've heard about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I guess you want to give us a mini tour of uh, of the distillery where you are at the moment, a kind of a, a snapshot of what you might get on one of our hourly d distillery tours. Yeah, so you, you can't see, uh, you can see half of a still over here. So this is our spirit still. Um, but just behind the camera is uh, is our wash still, 5,000 litre wash still. Um, and we distill kind of in two rounds. So you've got your round one and your wash still. And then everything that we we do in there on like, on set, for example, on the Monday, the next day, we're gonna use it in the spirit still on a Tuesday. Um, so yeah, the wash seal, we bring down uh, 5,000 liters, 8%, um, that's our wash, that's that's a daily wash. Um, and then we're gonna get that to temperature in the still. Um, again, yeah, you can only kind of see half of it. Um, but um, that's gonna get to temperature, we're gonna extract that alcohol. It's gonna go down the line arm. Uh, you can't see the line arm, but basically a line arm kind of connects uh, to a condenser. And that's gonna, hot vapor is gonna meet a cool condenser. It's gonna turn back to a liquid um, and it's gonna come into our spirit safe over here. Uh, so your wash still is over this side, your spirit still is over here. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, we'll, have, we'll have turned that 5,000 liters at 
into about 1700 liters at 25 percent and we call that your low wines and um we use the low wines uh, on the next day because that's not well whiskey's got to be at 40 percent we're in at 25 uh, and then we're going to start cutting it the next day uh, so this side so the same process um except for half of the year uh, we use our column which is just over here um, you'll have seen column stills in other distilleries if you've visited them before. Uh, gin distilleries, um, grain, whiskey. Um, but um, a little bit different how we use it here. So, um, see if you can see it. So, we've got a couple of uh, levers just at the top. So, we actually divert vapor into the column and create a loop between two stills. Okay. Um, the column is going to give us a lighter, uh, fruitier spirit. Uh, higher ABV on a standard run on your on standard pot still um, we'll be taking about 75% uh, on the column we're going to be looking at high 80s um, and I'm just going to jump in there Dom why why is that why does the column give us a higher ABV? Think, think of the column like a big purifier um, I think you're gonna you're gonna show a video later on maybe um, but inside here we've got four copper plates uh, with holes in so basically that vapor is going to work through the extra copper contacts. And we always say, I think one of the questions was um, why copper? Um, copper's a great reactive surface and it's going to kind of, if you look under a microscope, for instance, a simple way of putting it kind of like a Brillo pad, and um, it's going to kind of get rid of some of those heavier uh, sulfur compounds. We're looking for all those light fruity flavors really. Um, so the more copper contacts, the lighter, fruitier spirit really um there are two kind of different ways that we do it half of the year um but the main part of it your bread and butter we have three cups or three stages if you want of the distillation process so you've got your your heads heart your tails or your your four shots middle cut or your faints whatever terminology you prefer uh so your four shots on the morning we're going to run that for about 10 15 minutes of the process and that's really to get rid of any unwanted flavors um, aromas of the of the previous the back end of the previous run um, and we don't use any automation here everything is is manual so we'll be nosing and we'll be tasting uh, once we're happy that we've kind of got to a point where we're happy to cut uh, we, we flick over to a different tank and that's going to be our middle cut and, and that's that's the liquid spirit that's going to be going into our spirit receiving vessel at the end of the week and then eventually into casks Okay, so just again quickly just to interrupt. So how do you how do you know? It's not automated. There's no kind of like green light that suddenly clicks on when you get to the right bit. So how do you I how do you know? to me. <laughs> you are? Uh, well, I've, I've done a fair few distillations now and yeah learning from the guys here who they did it for Tom and Dave did it for a year before I even started here so um, When you're around it every day, you kind of pick up what exactly what we're looking for uh, to go into our our spirit style, if you want, but yeah, light and fruity, they're words that we say a lot in this distillery on tours, and yeah, in their tasty notes, if you want, as well. Yeah, so it just sort of becomes second nature that that's how you know, yeah, exactly. you just start to get that that's just, that's that's right. As with any cooking, I guess, you just start to be able to instinctively pick up. It is, yeah, it's, um, when you remember first starting out and you would be doing it so many times, and then all of a sudden, you just kind of know. But yeah, we, it's usually, you're looking between 10 and 15 minutes, um, you'll be getting your nose on it uh, 10 minutes into the four shots and then yeah but it's different every day it could be 12 minutes cut it could be 15 minutes it's, it's just finding that point that where you're happy to uh, get that middle cut into the into the vessel into the ISR the intermediate spirit so okay cool so then and then after that then what happens after that yeah so that's going to go at the end of the week so four distillations that's all going to go into you see that tank? Yeah, that tank just there. That's our spirit receiving vessel. Um, so when we're not running the column, that's going to be, yeah, roughly 75%. And um, we're going to bring water down from the farm. And um, we cut that back to 63.5%. And that's our cask strength. And, um, and yeah, we, we fill the casks. But yeah, between 12, 13, 14 casks a week at the moment. Nice, and then there, and there are all sorts of different casks. So uh, primarily we fill bourbon casks, but there'll be all sorts of other ones as well thrown in there just. Yeah, the 90 roughly 90% bourbon, but yeah, there's that many different sherry casks now and uh, red wine and uh, 
it, it's, it's always fun when Joe comes down from the warehouse with different uh, samples and see where they're all at. Especially now when we've been distilling for four years and kind of seeing from since when I started and we were, I think that our very first tours were, it was an eight month spirit, some of it that people were trying and enjoying. So yeah, yeah it's completely different now. Totally different now. So we've got a first question that's come in um, and that is what would make an automated system change change it to the middle cut? So if you were using an automated system, I mean, this is a bit tricky yeah. if we didn't use it. A lot of computers, there'll be set, set times, set temperatures if you want. Um, but this is it. When I, when I say it can come in at different times, it can come in early, it can come in late. We're, we're small enough distillery and, and, and set up if you want to these little efforts, everything as well, being an English whiskey distillery, it, it's a very niche market anyway, isn't it? And every, every, anything we can do is, is flavour driven. And if we can make it taste the best it can, then we're going to do it every day. Cheers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so it's gone into the casks now. So um, we'll, one of the questions that was sent in advance to us um, for this. Um, oh, hang on. Actually, wait. We've got another question that's just come in. And that's which is really interesting. Uh, so this one is from David Walker. So having grown up in Hummonby, so well done, another Hummonby local, we, we like those. Uh, I know how hard the water is. How does that affect the end result and does distillation take it out? Um, so interestingly with that one, I'm gonna jump in a bit too, yeah. which is that um, actually one of the interesting things about the farm, so if you know Hummonby, we're actually not, we're technically on the boundary of Hummonby. It's a very boring niche county boundaries thing, but we're so on the border that the, it A, runs through the farm and B, we have a, we have a Hummonby phone number and a Driffield postcode. So we we sit between East Yorkshire and North Yorkshire. Um, so we're on the way out to Wald Newton, right on the edge of the farm was originally part of the Hummonby estate, but pretty much like the furthest edges of it, which is hence why it's called Hummonby Grange, which is the farm. Anyway, this is the slight diversion, but what we do have on the farm is we're totally supplied by our own water supply. There's no no mains water here. So the first borehole was sunk in, I think, 1937. Um, so that, that sits down in the dale. So you can see that if you're walking just out of Hemmon beyond the centenary way. Uh, so that comes up from there. And then also we have another borehole at the top of the farm now as well that was put in in the 90s. Uh, so the the water, it comes straight up through the chalk. So actually it is a bit softer than you would expect um, from Hummonby because it really is directly from the chalk and it's, it's come straight out of the walls, whereas Hummonby is right on the edges of the walls there and sort of dipping into a different um, different rock source, I think. So I don't, personally, I don't know if distillation takes it out, but that's that's what I find from oh, yeah. the- That sounds right to me. Yeah, it's, we, we never have any issues. So. Yeah, it's not super hard. We, we find that up here as well, actually at the farm. There's, um, in terms of like lime scale, it does it never feels as hard as as water does in a, in other places. Um, I won't say that that's what makes it taste so delicious because there's so many different arguments about whether actually water and terroir have a have a point on that. Um, but uh, <laughs> I don't know that one yet. Consistent water is uh, is a big part of of the whiskey process. So yeah, we've yeah, it's, it's, it's a great supply for us. Yeah, it just means that we can be as consistent as possible. But really good question. Thank you very much. Um, so where I was going to ask just before that is um, is about distilling on cold days versus hot days. So as you said, last week, absolutely boiling, roasting hot. This week, everyone's had the heating back on and suddenly no one's in shorts. Everyone's in uh, trainers and socks and, and yeah. fleece. And jumpers. I think on last week, let's say. Uh... <laughs> yeah, a bit different. <laughs> and uh, last week, I think you were all in at like yeah. half time. Basically for us, that is, we, we've got to keep that spirit between 15 and 25 degrees. That's That's your sweet spot. Um, once we start, you're going to get a heavier spirit. It, and it, it basically means we're going to come in earlier when it's a little bit cooler um, and we're going to run it slower just to keep it in like those parameters because if you're making it in February or in July, in, in four years' time, you want that consistent product. It, 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 it needs to be, well, consistent. Yeah, it, it's... Um, so if it means a, an earlier start, longer day, then yeah, we're prepared to do it. That's good. Well done. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's always a tricky one. I know talking to David, he says like, yeah, hot hot days are a yeah. really hot in there with the stills running, and b my quiet uh, walk through Hummonby. Yeah, sometimes in the morning. Yeah, I bet actually. Yeah, no one else is around, especially not at the moment. Um, 
So actually, one of the other questions we we're going to ask is about distilling using the column still, but actually you've talked about that. So 50% of, well, 50% of yeah. the time, half the so, year, yeah. the column still. Half the year. We're running it right now. Uh, we've been running it since mid-February. Um, we'll be swapping back, yeah, roughly mid-August. Um, but to kind of give you a little, a bit more into it, um, just having that, those options in the warehouse of different spirits. In, in the cask of the column, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work a little bit faster. Um, but um, uh, give you a little example of the, if you've tried any of the distillery projects. Uh, so uh, 001 was 60% from the pot, 40% column. Um, number two, we flipped it the other way around. And then number three and four were 50-50, um, which is um, kind of, I imagine, where the, the whiskey will be down the line. It's just, yeah, I suppose. What's right right now is what casts are performing best. We're running it four years, so in ten years, fifteen years, we'll see the. We're, this is it. You're taking samples all the time to see and making records, so make our life easier down the line. And yeah, we'll, Jay's, uh, we'll, Jay's we'll, been, yeah, Jay's been working hard on that for the last few weeks. Is definitely kind of up in the sampling game and and really keeping an eye on what casts have been doing well. So actually, if you've uh, if you've been able to get uh, packs and tickets and places on the birthday tasting that's coming up in a couple of weeks. I think there'll be quite a lot of discussion around the column still um, and the impact that that has just thinking about what those samples are going to be. I won't, I won't say anything else. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I'm just going to give it away. Uh, so we've had another question come in here, which is, does the time of year make a difference on whether we use the pot or the column still? No, it, the time of year is just since the start of production, they started with pot and then moved on to column and we just kind of kept it. We can flip it whenever we want, really. Um, but just to keep that good, keeping the warehouse stocked, kind of keeping it equal. Yeah. That's that's kind of what it's, it's down to at the moment. But um, whether that changes down the line, as we see what casts perform, I suppose. Um, but yeah, right now, it's it's just down to uh, that's how it started. Yeah, I'm sort of following on with that rhythm from there, rather than, oh, it's going to be hot next week. Let's do, let's do that. All this yeah, well. yeah. It, it, either way, it's... It, it doesn't change the fact that we've got to keep that spirit happy in those parameters. So yeah, column or not, it's uh, it doesn't make a difference really for us. Fair enough. Cool. Um, okay, and then and then a slightly less serious one. But what's your favourite part of the distilling process? Like, what's your whether that's just because you like the colour of something, or whether because you just it gives you time to go and have a cup of tea, or or for whatever reason, what's your what's your favourite type of the, of the distilling it's process? Fun smelling it on the morning, uh, even yeah. at six a.m. when you've got to get your nose on it, and knowing that that spirit one day will be going into a bottle in 10, 15 years as a whiskey. Um, also, when you see the column going, um, again, there's there's videos on our Facebook page, but when it, it's like a washing machine when that column gets going, it looks fantastic. If you think vapors are kind of rising. And uh, we've got a mini condenser at the top of it as well. So it's because some of it's going to drop back down. So it kind of meets and it's like crashing waves. It looks fantastic. That's always a fun one. That's good. Yeah. I like the spirit safe just because it's really pretty. That's <laughs> my favorite thing to look at. I think it just looks really nice with all the way the color, the copper's gone and it's all blue and coppery and it's just really nice to look at. And I like watching it through. I think it's quite mesmerizing when you stand in front of the spirit safe when it's running, let yeah. alone when you're actually monitoring it for anything useful. Um, okay, so we've got another question that came in, which is when will you be sending the packs for the tasting session? Uh, I'll answer that. Uh, they'll be going out at some point next week. Yeah, next week. So that'll be the week before the, the session starts. So they'll be um, they'll be coming to your post box. You know, really nice. So we're just busy putting all of those together at the moment. Uh, so I think that's kind of the end of my questions that I was going to ask about this. So, so Dom, is it... <clears throat> Sorry, is there anything else that you would like to just add in that you don't think we've covered off properly? Um, I, I can go deep into it. I, I tried to do a very condensed version of the tour. Um, but yeah, we, we can go back onto the cuts if you want, because that is a Yeah, bit actually, more... that would be good. Why don't you talk a bit more about the cuts and what you're looking yeah, for right. and, and how you decide? Yeah, so when we're getting the nose on it, like I said, 10, 15 minutes, you're finding all this, it can, it can change very, very quickly. And it is, it's, it's not very technical. You literally will just knock it straight over into a different tank, but it's a yeah, split second. And then we're just kind of recording um, temperature, ABV. Um, and then we're going to monitor that. 
usually I do, it's roughly about an hour and a half that middle cut's going to run. Um, again, depending on the weather, <laughs> that plays a big part. Uh, at the moment, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but as, as long as that spirit's coming out smelling fantastic, then we're happy. Um, but yeah, the column at the moment, yeah, you're looking at 87, 88%. Pretty strong stuff. But um, uh, as well, little things as well, I suppose. Um, uh, when, when the wash still gets to temperature, um, it smells fantastic in here. Um, you're getting a lot of banana bread, a lot of pineapple. Um, when people are walking in, well, we don't currently have the cafe, but when the girls are walking in and, and they're saying, oh, that smells good today. And you'll get different, some days you'll just get random aromas that you've never really smelt before on the on the middle cut. And it's just really interesting. Or one day you'll get some herb that you've, you've just kind of pulled out of nowhere 10 minutes into the far shops. And, um, so it's always a little bit different every day. That's good. That sounds nice. Okay, we've had another question come in, which is, could you use the stills the other way around to get a different spirit style? What is in the, use the wash still and the spirit still? Uh, we would have to have a right good clean. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yeah, um, so to kind of put it into perspective for you, at the, the end of the day, the wash still will get a good clean. Um, the spirit still, um, that's, got our, that's our character of our spirit in there. Um, that's that's probably going to get a clean maybe maybe once a year I suppose. Um, so yeah, we don't really want to be touching that every day. Um, but yeah, you wash still. You, you want all that copper con clean copper contact. So we be, that gets a good clean every day. And then today you got an even even more of a proper clean because we're not distilling. So yeah, especially in hot weather, um, you want to make sure that everything is running efficiently. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, another very good question that's just come in now. I feel like this is a Joe question. Uh, does a night out at the pub the previous night impact your view on the cut point <laughs> the following morning? Well, I have young children, so I don't get to the pub anymore. <laughs> I was going to say, I think <laughs> you and me are both nine o'clock <laughs> at the time, aren't we, at the moment? <laughs> yeah, yeah if, not if you're coming in early. You won't be, uh, you won't be going to any pubs. But yeah, yeah it's... Um, because yeah, it's very strong alcohol to be smelled. If you're not used to it, it's it's pretty strong on the nose at, uh, at half eight in the morning. If it's if it's clocking up near ninety percent, but um, we don't have to taste it every day. You can get a lot from the nose, and um, that again, practice on that. But um, yeah, I know I know Alex and Tom at the just at the brewery both say that that checking beers when you can still taste toothpaste is a funny old <laughs> is a funny old feeling, and it just it just seems very strange and a bit um, a bit a bit. Uh, Naughty. Yeah. Um, okay, well, so no more questions coming in at the moment. So what we'll do is actually this distill it, this uh, this topic for this week's um, uh, Feels the Bottle really tied in very neatly with an announcement we made last night, which is that we are now in a position where we can resume our tours again. So as of the 13th of July, we're really pleased to say that we're able to welcome uh, you guys and anyone back to the distillery again to to take part in our hourly tours so oh, sorry hour la hour long tours they're not hourly um but we've had to change a few things around a bit naturally to fit with the relevant guidelines and just to make sure that we're doing things as safely as we possibly can and not putting anyone at risk so um if you are interested in tours have a look at our the tour booking page on the website that's got the full list of requirements and, and what we're doing and what we're implementing and um, also a bit of what we expect from customers coming to the distillery as well uh, but in a nutshell we're running two tours every day now instead of three so those tours are now 11 and one we're doing them seven days a week still they still last an hour you still get the full tour experience you get the film at the beginning explaining how we got there uh, you get a full tour of the distillery with Dom or one of our other team members taking you through it. And at the end, you get a tasting session with three different uh, samples and you also get your nose and glass to take home. Uh, but uh, the kind of the technicalities and the specifics of how you do the tour have had to obviously adapt. Um, so uh, I've just got an excellent comment, a question that's just come in. I, I think this might have come from David, which is, do you know more than Joe? Does anyone know more than Joe? I don't think they do. I don't think it's possible. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Now, now the test will be as if Joe's watching this as to whether we both get a text in a minute saying something along the lines of absolutely not. 
Um, anyway, back to back to what we were talking about with the tours. So tours are now uh, so they're now available to book starting again on the 13th of or from the 13th of July. So visit visit the website uh, to book those tours. It's mandatory that you have to book in advance. We can't take walk-in tours at the moment. That just enables us to plan and make sure we've got the relevant members of staff on site and all the right kind of PPE and stock and ready to go. Um, if you have tours that have had to be postponed that you maybe had booked for March or April or May or June and you've postponed them uh, and you'd like to start rescheduling those, just give us a call on 01723 during working hours and uh, opening hours, which are 10 to 4, Monday to Friday. And, uh, and one of the team on the, on the at the end of the phone will will happily get you booked back in again. Likewise, if you have one of our complimentary gift vouchers that we've been uh, giving away with um, two or more bottles of whiskey sales on the website, then give us a call and we'll be able to get you booked in on those too. So really exciting news. The, the downside is that the coffee shop still isn't open, we're afraid. Um, so no, no coffees or cakes or fry ups because we're trying to just do things in a phased approach, making sure that we're doing things as carefully and as safely as possible. And essentially, we don't want to bite off more than we can chew and end up having to close down or causing problems or making anyone uncomfortable. So we'll be opening the coffee shop once we've kind of got into the swing of things with the tours and we're feeling much more comfortable about that. And also we've got a couple more things in place as well. Um, then, oh, then the other thing is the classic thing. I was just signed up to the newsletter because we've got some really exciting announcements coming out in the next couple of weeks and we wouldn't want anyone to miss out. Uh, if there's any more questions coming in, I don't think there are, but we'll give it a couple more seconds to see if any more questions are coming in. Dom's standing there ready and waiting. Look, he's so desperate to answer things. Um, and if there's nothing that comes in, then we'll probably say, uh, we'll probably say good night. So thank you very much, Dom. That was great. Any last words? Hopefully see you all soon. Yeah, yeah. It'd be really nice to. We're all looking forward to seeing new faces again, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And having some Filey Bay fruit cake too. I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> definitely. We'll go through the window as I'm distilling. <laughs> <laughs> or someone just brings you a plate of something when they're feeling kind. Um, okay, I think with that, no more questions. So to that end, we'll say, uh, good night. Have a lovely Wednesday evening and we'll see you at the same time next week. Bye-bye. Cheers, guys. Hi, Joe. How are you doing? Good evening, Jenny. I'm good, thank you. How are you getting on? Yeah, not bad, thank you. Not bad. What have you been up to today in your um, living room of dreams? Yeah, so uh, today has wow. been um, some tasting work and some tasting at work, um, but it's been it's been focused in on other other areas today. Yeah, I got a barrage of emails from you at one point today, and I was like, Joe is on it, on the admin side today. Oh, yes. It has to be, yeah. to be an admin day every now and again, and that was today. So it wasn't, I, I, it certainly wasn't the most exciting day, but, um, but on the whiskey side of stuff, you know? Yeah, but productive, <laughs> which is what happens to happen anyway. <laughs> uh, okay. So we've got a few people who are joining us. Hello. We've got one comment already. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Uh, so thanks very much for joining us. We're really sorry we had to postpone last week. Something came up right at the last minute and just uh, it was just not practical to try and to try and squeeze everything in. We would have done this very badly. So we thought the best thing to do was to postpone it to this week and give it our full attention and do it all properly. So hello. Today is uh, Field to Bottle number 10. We're on. So we're into our 10th week of doing it. Uh, and and sadly, it's also going to be our penultimate session of uh, Field to Bottle Facebook Lives just because We've been talking through the process from field to bottle. Now we've basically reached the bottle. So we're, we're at the end. So this week we'll be talking about the bottle, uh, our bottling process, why we do it ourselves in the distillery. Uh, and we'll also be doing a tasting session of second release, which Joe's already stepping ahead on there, as you can see. And um, uh, and then next week, which will be our last session, we'll be, have it, we'll be talking through our two finished whiskies. So our Filey Bay Moscatel finish, which came out in March, and our Finally Bay STR finish, which we announced the launch of last weekend. And um, we announced the launch of last weekend and uh, we'll be uh, dispatching orders for um, kind of late July, early August. So hello to everyone who said hello. Hi, Amanda, hope you're doing well. Appreciate my new haircut, that's good. It's the sign of post lockdown is that everybody suddenly got their haircuts and is looking much smarter and a bit more kempt. Um, how about you, Joe? you had your haircut yet? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I actually got it done in time for last week's Field to Bottle. 
um, oh. you know, so. I it for you. I'm sorry. Well, look, you know, these things happen, you know, but I did manage to actually, I managed to steal my nephew's uh, hair appointment, um, which was a great accomplish. Uh, you know, I could probably if you gave it up, I thought it would have cost me a tenner or something, but I managed to just kind of charm it out of him. So I'm sure he'll levy that against me at some point. I was going to say, that sounds like a, a good Christmas present or a sneaky bottle of whiskey at some point when he's significantly older. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know your nephew is, <laughs> which one you're talking about, so I'm not going to say anything too much. Yeah, exactly. yeah, he's got a few years to go before he can be drinking whiskey. But Well, that's good. But he's got the right <laughs> to there anyway. Yeah, um, but when he, when he is drinking whiskey, it'll be Filey Bay, obviously, you know. Well, if he's a Yorkshire lad, then he shouldn't be drinking anything else anyway. That and World Top Beer, what else could you, that's like the ultimate start into your, into, uh, <laughs> into, into your introduction to alcohol. Um, also, there's some cracking Yorkshire wine that's coming out at the moment, so I think we're all sorted there. So, hi, Ian. Yeah, we know, can't wait for STR. We're really looking forward to getting it out to you. We're sort of just getting everything sorted in the distillery at the moment. We're going to be bottling that very shortly, in fact, very soon, in yeah. the next few days. Uh, and then and then we'll be able to get it all packed up and, and out, out to um, everyone who's waiting so patiently. So thank you very much. So we've got a few people that have joined us now. So we'll, we'll actually get cracking on it properly rather than me and Joe just going off on a tangent. Um, so hello, everybody. Welcome to Fields Bottle number 10. Today we're going to be talking about the bottle, our bottling process and our second release uh, whiskey as well, which came out in November last year, 2019, which is still less than a year ago, which I do find strange to think about, Joe. I don't know if you it, yeah it's quite weird it kind of it kind of feels longer um yeah because we've been so so kind of flat out really last kind of few months um but yeah kind of a lot's happened since then yeah hasn't it i mean just so much and uh yeah it's been really really exciting so actually there's, there's lots of stuff we've got in the plan for the next uh the next few weeks so if you're on our newsletter subscriber list um, or you're a cask owner, you'll have literally just received in your inboxes uh, our latest newsletters. Um, and they'll be telling you that there's something very special coming at the end of July. So and giving you specific dates in which to watch your inbox. So, uh, so do keep an eye out for that. Uh, we can't have our open day this year for obvious reasons, but we have been working on things to make that a little less disappointing. So we've got other stuff coming out there, but more on that coming on our Facebook posts uh, over the next coming days. Uh, so I am Jenny. I head up the marketing here at the Spirit of Yorkshire Distillery, and uh, this is Joe. Joe, what do you do? Um, so I make sure whiskey tastes good. That's that's a big part of it, um, amongst other things, of course. <laughs> Speaking uh, of in your van. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, you know, seeing customers, making sure that you know we're getting out there, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, Joe's the man with the most incredible cask-filled spreadsheet. So he's the one that knows everything that's going on in the warehouse. It's very exciting when you look at it. It's all colour coded and very beautifully done. Um, so we'll we'll start. We'll get started. So, um, uh, so we. Uh, sorry, I'm just getting getting distracted by the comments. You'd think I've done this enough by now, but I still get distracted by looking at them. Anyway, I need to get focused. Sorry, we're being very distracted today. So, firstly, we're going to talk about the bottle itself why we made the bottle i know we touched on this in our first release um broadcast that we did a few weeks ago but it's sort of worth talking about again it's quite it's, it's, it's been done for a very specific reason uh and then um we're going to be talking about bottling on site and why we bottle and then lastly we'll be going through and joe will be doing a mini tasting session of our highly based second release so first things first joe talk to us about the bespoke bottle why why bespoke bottle obviously we did uh, distillery projects were done in a in a fairly standard shaped bottle, but for first, second, and ensuing releases, we have this very special bottle. Why why did we go for a bespoke one? Yeah, so I suppose you can you can sum that up in in the fact that we just wanted to do do this whiskey justice, and you know from, from day one, you know we wanted to get get our own bottle and get a mold done for us. Um, which isn't, you know, it's something a lot of distilleries wouldn't do. It's, a, it's, it's you know, it's a kind of, it's a big undertaking. Um, and, you know, it's a really expensive piece of work to, to undertake, you know, especially when you're kind of pre-whiskey. Um, but we wanted to do it. I think I think if you want a kind of one main reason for this, um, you know, we, we, we could only launch Yorkshire's first whiskey once. And, you know, it was really important to us that it, that it looked the part. And, 
And you know, beyond that, beyond that, you have um, you know a, a bottle which which is identifiable as yours. You know, so it does it makes sure that it stands out. People recognise the whiskey that you're making. Um, and you know, on top of that as well, you've got something where you have an opportunity to add that extra layer of of, of, of the story of what you're doing and what you're making into that as well. So, yeah, I think you know, there's, there's there's lots of lots of advantages to doing it. Um, but as I say, it's not something that perhaps younger distilleries would consider. Uh, in fact, you know, there's distilleries that have been operating for you know 100 years plus, or, or even old bottlers as well, old indie bottlers. Again, that always opt for kind of stock glass. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's something that you know we always wanted to do. Again, right from day one, you know, it was always on right on the the list. You know, we want our own our own bottle um, for Yorkshire whiskey. Yeah, it was a really important part of the design brief when we spoke to the design agency and they pitched the work and they they won they won the they won this uh, this job and this project and it was all about how do we how do we stand out and make ourselves special and and having that level of interest in the bottle was really important. In fact, someone's just written on the the comments that he's made he's made tumblers with the first and second releases and I know somebody else has done that too where they've right. cut it down and used the embossed section to make really beautiful tumblers and there's something like that that's that keeps the keeps the bottle living it doesn't just get chucked into the recycling as soon as it's finished so that was quite important for us as well is that people didn't just buy into the whiskey although that is obviously the crucial thing but they actually they kind of really engaged with what was going on there too Oh, there we go. Someone else has just said that they hate letting the empty bottles go. They like the bottles so much. So that's good. Thank you very much. That helps our, uh, our egos immensely when we read comments like that. So I think uh, we'll just do a quick kind of thing on the bottle. So one of the nicest things about the bottle was actually was actually watching the bottle get made. So a few of us did a bit of a road trip and field trip out to Allied Glass in Nottingley, just down in uh, South Yorkshire and uh it was absolutely fascinating not least because it is the hottest place i've ever ever been is to watch this um bottle get made so actually this is probably the better picture where you can see here that it starts off with this kind of gloop well firstly they took us through all the molds and showed us how they built the molds and, and what that did and that was exceptionally intricate as well um and then this was just so exciting as anyone if you've seen glass being blown it's kind of amazing how it goes from sand right through to um right through to being a, a bottle and somehow there's this amazing transformation that takes place just because of heat and we thought that was absolutely amazing so you can see here just how hot the bottles are when they come off the line and one of the things that they say to you is don't touch even though it's really exciting and the bottles come off further down and they're still not red or orange but they say just whatever you do do not touch these bottles and then you realize that it's just absolutely boiling and it's just so hot um, but really exciting to see them being made it was absolutely amazing if you're into um yeah you know kind of just just engineering watching that transformation from sand through to this it, yeah incredible the heat as you say is really intense like that was definitely the hottest place i've ever stood yeah um, exactly you've got you've got your big coat on and then you've got ear defense like um ear, ear plugs in and you've got glasses on and you've got to wear gloves and it just it is just so hot and the whole experience was amazing um and we weren't even there on a particularly hot day it was pretty great not a million miles away from the weather today it just yeah it was so so different but actually i think for all of us it was just another way of feeling even more connected to this product so not just the whiskey inside which we obviously see being made continuously um and we see it go from those kind of the empty fields right through to to the um to the liquid going into the casks at the end but then to see it kind of in in this like this element of the 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 whiskey kind of full whiskey bottle creation process was really exciting, and so that gets us then to something that looks like this with that that intricate detailing on the bottom of the bottle, really exciting. And actually, so now if we talk about we'll talk a bit more about the kind of the why um, why that pattern is there. So Joe, do you want to just talk a bit about what the design agency talked to us about when they were when they were sort of selling in the design to us? Yeah, sure. So you know the the yeah the the well the pictures there kind of sum it up largely. Um, yeah, you know, so we have this kind of uh, pattern rolling around the bottom. Um, we also use that in the carton as well and kind of elsewhere. Um, but yeah, it kind of it does. It symbolises the land. It symbolises the sea. Um, and and you know where exactly where we are. You know we're you know we can see we can see the sea from the distillery windows and 
you know, we have the, the farm kind of on one side and the sea on the other. So, you know, we are, we are you know, where the land meets the sea. And, and, and this is really nice because it does, it ties the two, the two things together. Um, so, yeah, you know, it, 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 to me, it's very obviously coastal. Um, but if you spend a bit more time, the more you kind of, you, the more time you spend with this bottle in your hand and the packaging and looking at it, um, yeah, you know, you can see those other connections to it as well. So definitely. Uh, no, I need to need to angle this right. But so this is the roundel that sits on the top of every um, every bottle, every carton that we have. You'll see so this pattern, these kind of rolling waves on the um, on this side. No, this side. Sorry. And Joe's got it there as well. That's the same pattern that's embossed onto the glass that's onto that capsule that you'll see that then actually if you start looking out for it, you'll see that it kind of weaves its way through certain things. And that's actually an evolution of some of the patterns that we had, the wave patterns that we had on the distillery project bottles as well as that there's mm -hmm. a wave pattern. I can just you can see it really clearly on 003 and um, and into the, the bottom band even on 001. And that's just how that's evolved over the past five, how many? three, four years that we've been doing those. So that's yeah. where all of these design details come from. So once you kind of start looking for those things, you'll start to see it in lots of different places and it'll start to come through. And on some of the some of the future the releases that we're gonna have, you'll start to see that coming through more prominently as well. Um, and that's nice, Liz, uh, Libby, who's one of our tour guides, just said that she likes that little logo. Thanks Libby, that's good. Uh, so we'll actually, that's a good reminder that we'll, we'll be talking about our tours, which are resumed later on in this uh, session. Anyway, so, so that's kind of talking about the bespoke bottle and the details on the bottle itself. So now if we kind of go away from like what the bottle actually looks like to, to the filling of the bottle. So one of the things that we talk about is, is being filled to bottle. So we're in control of pretty much every aspect that we can be. The only, the only aspect of the whiskey making process that we outsource at all is the malting, but as you'll have seen in our previous Fields Fossil episode about malting, we still have a really high level of control on that because we have such a strong relationship with Muntins. They're so close and they're such a world-class uh, maltster that it makes sense to use them on our doorstep. So Joe, talk to us about bottling on site. Why Why is it important that we do that ourselves? Sure, so for, for us, it's, it's, you know, it closes the loop. It just seemed a little bit crazy. You know, we've gone through um, this, all the steps right from grassroots, you know, um on the farm growing the barley to to get to get our whiskey together and to get a batch of it together and then outsource that final step um you know for us just didn't make sense at all you know uh, it, it doing it ourselves it's, it's a lot of work you know it's a lot of extra work it takes a lot of time um and you know it's 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 a busy busy period to do it but the advantages of doing it for for, for us um you know largely is a, is control you know, so we're not relying on another company to do it for for us. You're not relying to drop into a production schedule at a bottling plant. Um, you know, you're not having to send, you know, whiskey that's been, you know, completely made in this county and sending this to be bottled in a different county or, or, or even into a different country. You know, you're doing everything um, within within this kind of the walls of the distillery. And... You know, I think for us, it, you know, it's not just about it's not just about the practical considerations because there are practical advantages to doing it. You know, you, you because you have that control element, you don't have to worry about, you know, you're not kind of handing over this kind of precious thing that you've been working on for four years to another company to put into a bottle for you. Um, not, so, you know, some very, very good bottling companies out there. Obviously, they're very, very good at what they do. Um, but, yeah, the practicalities of being in that extra step of control is really good. Um and yeah, on top of that, I think actually the the ethos and just the just the simple production principle of being field to bottle and having that autonomy is is brilliant. And it does mean as well when we do smaller uh, runs, you know, it gives us more flexibility. You know, we can we can set up our bottling line um, and do something quite you know do a smaller bottling run, you know, and react much quicker to something like that than a distillery that doesn't have a bottling line. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of perks, a lot of pros to it. Uh, that said, the negatives of it is is that it's a lot of work and it's a lot of extra effort and it requires a lot of hands and uh, and it's 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 busy and it's tiring. <laughs> it is, I mean, yeah, it is. And actually, to be fair, I've actually not really I'm, done any whiskey bottling, which is the best thing I've managed to get away from that. But I definitely did my fair share of early days Waltop Brewery bottling when, yeah. yeah. You you can't. You, you, I was going to mention this, and 
one part again which is significant here is that you know in terms of tom's experience particularly you know having um having set up bottling lines with the brewery you know again for from for the point of view of us to not do it ourselves would have seemed really um really crazy to be honest given the experience that we've got as well um, the ideal would have been if we could because the brewery has such a fantastic setup with the bottling line there and does contract bottling for other breweries as well the ideal would have been as if we could have basically put a whiskey add-on onto um onto that and could have utilized that system but sadly uh the two things couldn't quite merge which is as uh, tom will say is very disappointing from a financial point of view because he's always looking for ways to make everything pay for itself in multiples um so yeah what's interesting is thinking about back to how the brewery started where we were bottling by hand using bottle tops that use like um almost like hand pulls that you put on and then you, you wipe them down, put them through a very weird contraption that we had with a, a fan heater on top to try and dry them off before we put the labels on. We're, like, we're much more sophisticated than that at the distillery and you can really see, but it's still a labour of love and it still requires multiple members of the team coming and doing it. And so there's quite an amazing camaraderie that comes through. Uh, there's quite an amazing camaraderie that comes through when we're, um, when we're doing, when the bottling is actually happening. Uh, so we had a couple of comments here from some friends of the distillery. They say smaller bottling runs, any single cast bottling runs planned? Well, for smaller bottling runs, Jeff, read your emails <laughs> and uh, there might be something exciting coming later on this month. I can't promise about single casks though, but but we've got lots of exciting stuff in the uh, in the pipeline. Um, and uh, Paul was asking about cask number 146. That's, uh, no, that's just a, a great cask that we've... Uh, We've taken a few sneaks out of for the um, for the tasting session coming up soon. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in fact, actually, I'm just going to pause there. We had a question that came through about gin, and when you were talking, Joe, about the ethos about being in control of production and doing everything ourselves, right from field to bottle, actually, that links neatly in, into into the question about gin. So, Alison Parker asked um, about ten minutes ago, why do you do gin? And uh, the answer is no. And I'm, I'm sorry for those who've watched all of these because you know you'll have heard this uh, spiel a couple of times before. But Joe, do you want to just give a quick outline as to why we decided we made that decision not to not to make gin and just to focus solely on the whiskey? I think I think you've kind of you've almost answered it just there because you know for us we're we're able to focus on this and only this and making this as best as we possibly can. Um, and if you have an, another another kind of project running alongside it um best will in the world you know especially with gin it would have taken you know a lot of extra time a lot a lot, a lot of extra effort and you know there's i suppose there's a few reasons beyond that you know the, the general production principle of white spirits isn't really kind of a field to bottle principle it's not to say you can't do it field to bottle but um you know in the most part if you're looking at kind of gin production or how you want to make gin it's a case of um starting with a neutral base spirit so you've either got to make that neutral base spirit which requires um you know, kind of sophisticated distilling equipment and a lot of time and energy or you can buy that spirit in and then do the, the other bits um like rectify it and add your flavor profile to it and that kind of thing um so so for us it didn't fit with the ethos it didn't fit with the field to bottle principle for us we would have had to have invested in more kits more time it's more energy um and yeah and then aside from that i think you know i suppose i can ask you this question jenny do you think the world needs another gin right now i mean i'm slowly working my way through the entire selection that yorkshire distilleries have to offer and uh and they taste delicious so i think yeah there is an argument to say that actually we it was a very crowded marketplace with yeah. some people doing it fantastically um and it and in order to have kind of lived up to our own philosophies to do it as well as we possibly could do and be one of the best which would always be our ambition as it is with the whiskey i think it would have taken so much time effort determination and and people that we just didn't have the focus for that. We're still a small distillery, we're a really small team. Um, we'd have essentially needed to probably double our team in order to focus on the gin with the same enthusiasm and focus that we that we put into the whiskey. So those are all of those reasons as to why we didn't, we didn't go for doing gin. Um, but there are some, some fantastic gins. I've been slowly working my way through a bottle of Cooper King's uh, kind of, sort of standard, sounds like the wrong word, but I can't think what it's called, but they're, bait, they're sort of flagship gin and it is, very delicious and very yeah, much. Very tasty indeed. 